Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Thank you again for joining me here at the back of the range. I'm your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 30. 30 episodes. Wow. Not sure how that happened, but it did. Really can't thank you all enough for listening each and every week. Thank you to all the guests that have taken the time out to join me here. From Joe Buck to Steve Burkowski and good friends like Greg O'Mahony and Scott Kennedy. It really has been an amazing six months. As long as everyone is enjoying the podcast, I'll keep putting out episodes. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. All of the episodes can be found in Apple Podcasts and Spotify. They can be found elsewhere, but those seem to be the main locations where everyone is listening to podcasts these days. The central hub of the podcast where you can download all of our episodes, head over to thebackoftherange.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. You'll find that information in the show notes of this episode. Speaking of Instagram, we started something called Free Towel Tuesdays. We have some really nice caddy towels with the center slit in them, so you can put them over an umbrella or an alignment stick. They have our logo on them, and we're giving them away. So all you need to do is follow us on Instagram. We're at the Back of the Range Podcast. And on Tuesdays, we'll ask you to like the page, tell your friends, maybe give us a tournament pick like we did yesterday for the Open Championship. Anyways, we want to get some more participation with our listeners, and you'll be rewarded for it. So just a little thank you from us. And hey, it's a golf towel. You can always use another golf towel. So for those of you that do have one of these towels already in your possession, we want to see it on social media. So next time when you're out, you add that towel, post a picture, tag us. You know the drill. You've done it before. We have some amazing episodes coming up this summer. I can't tell you anymore, but we have some great college coaches coming up. Maybe an LPGA player, um, some amazing amateurs. It's going to be a fun summer. Hope you enjoy the podcast and share it. I can't emphasize that enough. Please continue to share it with your friends, who you play with. We can't thank you enough for doing that. Okay, episode 30. Our guest this week is Nick Gillum. We've had a long line of Gators on the podcast, and we're going to add one more. This one's a national championship winner. Nick is not just a member of the 2001 national championship team that had Camila Vijegas and U.S. Amateur champion Bubba Dickerson, but he also won the individual title. We spoke about his time at UF, his time playing professionally, and one of the coolest damn jobs I've ever heard of in golf after he got done playing for a living, of course. So, Nick, thanks for the time. Welcome to the back of the range. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Ben. How are you? Nick, I'm doing great. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much for joining us here at the back of the range. You know, we have tons and tons to get to with you. I mean, winning a national championship at the University of Florida, transitioning into the professional game, and having that amazing job with FootJoy that we're going to get to a little bit later. But we always start our episodes off with just a little bit of background information, give our listeners an idea how you got into the game of golf, where you grew up. So go ahead and give our listeners just an idea of how you got started in the game. Sure. Yeah, it's. Um, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, so uh, my golf season was quite short. But um, uh, as a young man, my dad is uh, and still continues to be a very good player. He was county amateur champ three times and competed well in the state. So, uh, of course, he wanted to be out golfing selfishly when I was a young man, which I can relate to now having a three-year-old. But uh, he cut off some sawed off some sticks for me, and I'd be chasing him around with persimmon and balada back then, of course. But um, you know, it was it was a great uh, relationship builder and bonding time for us. And as I progressed uh, uh, into the game, around 12 or 13, it kind of was pretty quick to realize that I would be able to compete well in the state. So I started playing some state events. And, but with a short season, I still played basketball, being a tall guy. Sure. And uh, as uh, uh, I quickly also realized I was kind of slow and didn't jump very high, that I should probably focus on one sport and it, it turned to golf. So, um, I was lucky. It was, it's a great state to grow up playing golf, in, but it's just sadly a short season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Wisconsin really does have a, a, a lot of golf crazies up there. I mean, you just had the, the U S open at Aaron Hills and, uh, yep. obviously everything over, over at whistling Straits and black wolf run, but, uh, it, it sounds like just the weather and the opportunities in Florida, that's, pretty much was a huge draw. Now, were you recruited out of, out of Wisconsin to go play at the University of Florida? How did, how did that happen? 
Well, um, I was lucky enough when I was 16 to qualify for the U.S. Junior in Flagstaff, Arizona uh, at Forest Highlands. And I was, I finished in the quarterfinals and I hadn't played, I'd lost in the quarterfinals, excuse me, uh, to the eventual winner, Shane McMenemy. Um, I ended up getting invited to AJGA premier events because of that alone. We didn't play much AJGA due to cost and travel time, et cetera. Um, but we would, we decided to come down to the one in uh, Disney at the Magnolia and Palm course around Thanksgiving uh, that year. And uh, my dad's wife at the time was my stepmom had her brother living in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, long story short, they saw my discontent with me not playing well because I hadn't practiced much leading up to that point because there wasn't really ample opportunity in Wisconsin to play golf in October, November. And, uh, they were nice enough to invite me to move up and, or excuse me, move down and, and live with them and give golf a full-time run. So um, it was it was a big step, big chance. I was halfway to my junior year of high school and uh, just up and left, went to Gainesville. And I wasn't recruited uh, heavily by Florida after that, but Buddy saw me pretty much every day because Gainesville High School, where I went, um, did practice at UF golf course. So he's, he always claimed he was confused. He didn't know who I was because during the summer, I would say I was from green Bay versus Gainesville. So, nice. Nice. so, <laughs> so just you, so basically just through family out through just opportunities through your family, you just found yourself basically practicing right in the home, uh, right in the home course for the university of Florida. And at that time, yep. uh, really strong, really, really good powerhouse. Now you spent four years there, um, you know, you're a three-time all SEC academic selection. You were an all American in 2001, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, heavily in part because you won the national championship as an individual. Tell me about some of your experiences and some of, uh, uh, you know, just what was the team dynamic like at that time? Who were the guys on your team? We, uh, we had a really varied squad, uh, over time. We had, um, when I came on, uh, Robert Floyd had just left, but we had, uh, Steve Scott, uh, Josh McCumber was still there. Um, they were great guys, obviously, both very competitive, which we can talk about later. But uh, it, it's turned out that the Colombian connection really added the most uh, interest uh, to our team dynamic, nice. for sure. We had uh, Camilo Benedetti come first, and then uh, Camilo Vajegas was a, a freshman when I was a senior. Um, and then there were more Bajaguses and other Echeverias and, and Colombians that would keep coming up. But yeah, we, it was neat. We had a great pipeline of, of players that Buddy kind of kept bringing in and, and, you know, not a lot from Florida for the most part, you know, he'd, he'd really kind of try and change it up. But um, we had Bubba Dickerson on that team as well. We also had an Englishman named Ben Banks that was on our squad that uh, was a walk on that actually was the first person from our team to get full. Uh, he was the European tour status. But uh, his his family was of Genesis lore, so um, you know we we didn't learn that till later in life. Um, he was always kept he kept it a secret from us, so we wouldn't want to come visit his mansions in England. But uh, there's no <laughs> doubt um, we had we had a varied squad, a bunch of great 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 guys. Um, a lot of us did our own thing, and that was prior to uh, you know what was considered ex- extreme golf, uh, physio, uh, core, um, training. Um, so we didn't have those 5 a.m. workouts in the gym. We just go to the stadium instead and, you know, people would be puking on the state, the stadium stairs. So, so you just kind of did your own thing just, uh, and, and, you know, some of the guys on that team really, you, you just kind of rattled them off, but gosh, you know, you have Steve Scott who famously lost to tiger in the 96 us, uh, USAM. And then you have, uh, you know, obviously Camilo uh, made it on tour and then, you know, Josh McCumber with the, the whole, you know, the line of McCumbers, whether it's, you know, Mark or, or his brother, Tyler, who's now playing uh, web.com, I believe. Um, gosh, I mean, did you know you were surrounded by that many great players at the time or just was everyone just kind of on the same level? Did someone really stand out? You know, it's, it's funny in college. I'm sure it's, it's, certain to most for me at the time no i just was happy to play with good players and hope they would motivate me to be out there more and and get better but uh you would know it with um with buddy uh because he would he would certainly pay more attention to those that were kind of doing the right things because he did want to motivate you to be more like them and and that would be where it was more noticeable than not um 
you know, and, and a guy, and, you know, even Bubba Dickerson, he won a Western amateur and a U.S. amateur in the same summer, which is you know, a feat that not many people have done. And uh, you know, he was playing, I guess he was anywhere from two to three on our, our lineup for the most part, you know, so um, that, that, that kind of competition is hard to come by and it certainly does motivate you to become better. Sure. Well, you're, you're mentioning Buddy now. Most people don't know. So that's Buddy Alexander, who, who was the head coach for men's golf at the University of Florida. Uh, Correct. 80, what is it, 86? Uh, eh, it's probably about 87 or so. Eight, to yeah, 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 I don't know. And then I believe, hey, you're the no, researcher. No, Please. I know. Well, that's my fault. No, I was saying actually 87 U.S. Amateur winner, I believe. Oh, uh, no, uh, that was a 1986 U.S. Amateur. Yes, I do know that. I've heard that story. In fact, I've. So been lucky enough to play golf with him at Shoal Creek uh, later in life too, and he was quick to he was he, he pointed out a lot of golf shots he hit during that championship match. So. Yeah, yeah, we had Duke Butler the fourth on who I think was there at UF a little bit after you, and he shared some pretty good uh, buddy stories. I think they he liked to play matches against the guys, and uh, Duke mentioned that he won one and then wouldn't hear from Buddy when talked to him for a month. So uh, yeah, I'm sure that in this platform you would have a a, a you know plethora of stories you could share about your, about your old coach uh anytime things got a little ugly for you guys out there with him <laughs> never. never well that's a, that's a lie so you know what buddy was just a great competitor he still is the guy will he does not back down and uh he grinds hard and <laughs> probably one of the first times i i actually transferred back i went to chapel hill for a semester before i came back to florida um and uh, what, what was neat was we were playing a match play tournament together, which usually the winner would get a free pair, an additional pair of shoes, you know, because we all got free shoes, but we just get one more nice pair that you could pick out. Sure. And um, I got him, I got paired against him in the second round, I believe. And on the second hole, I think I'd already won the first and uh, second hole, he had a bad approach shot and he just full on helicoptered a golf club. I was looking over them. <laughs> this doesn't happen too often with an adult. I'm like this is an adult behavior. That's the role and, model. That's, that's the one that's <laughs> keeping you guys in check, right? Exactly. But, um, he ended up taking his thumping that, that day. And I think he gained a, a newfound respect for his transfer coming back to play with him. And, and he did, he, he, he was very modest after the round. So it shows his ability to understand the complexities of the game. Um, yeah, outside of that, we certainly had several different, uh, run-ins on the golf course there's no doubt buddy would would let you know if you're not doing something the right way and uh you were aware where you stood on the golf course um, quite a bit because buddy was one of those types of coaches that you know he, he not only led by example um and the way he would manage a golf course but he expected um you know that from a team captain which i became later on and uh would anticipate me to not make any mistakes that would, you know, he could have to retell at the dinner table later. Sure. Well, I mean, just through looking through all the different names, all different players you had there, you just have so many big, huge personalities. It's yes. obviously not expected that everyone's going to get along all the time. Just, you know, everything's going to be perfect. Is that pretty much commonplace that you felt with your team where everyone was pretty much friends and everyone pretty much worked together, but there were times when things just kind of got heated and competitive? Yeah, golf golf is, uh, you know, certainly not a team sport by any means. So there there, there were def definite run-ins, whether it was b between player and coach, player and assistant coach, player and player. And uh, those, those types of moments probably – only made us stronger over time, make you a better person in, in many ways if you uh, hopefully <laughs> adapt to the situation and learn from it. But um, yeah, I can, I could definitely say that uh, the personality component, um, not just with Buddy, but players was evident. I'll, I'll never forget watching Bubba and uh, Camilo Vegas, Bubba Dickerson and Camilo Vegas argue over a dozen golf balls that, uh, you know, Bubba left somewhere in a hotel room and Camilo picked up and Bubba was mad because he forgot where his golf balls went. And Camila said, I found them. They're mine now. And I thought they were going to fight each other in the airport. Um, <laughs> they had to be broken up. But, you know, those types of moments are what it's all about. We're competitive people. And um, in the end, it was all about individuals playing well for the betterment of the team. So, you know, the individual component won out more often than not. 
Well, and and I'm glad you told that story because it kind of gives me permission to lead into another story. Uh, uh, there was a uh, apparently some sort of a wrestling match between an inanimate object and Steve Scott. Oh, well, Steve, you know, he, he probably was one of the more <laughs> competitive human beings that I've run across in my life. Um, and I, I love him for that. He taught me a lot. That was one of the issues I, I most likely had as a, a professional player. I wasn't tough enough. And I'll tell you, Steve... He, he didn't want to lose to anybody. And uh, I think it was Camilo Benedetti. We were playing the Raven in uh, Arizona and I guess in Tempe or somewhere around there. It was uh, or Tucson, excuse me. It was uh, Arizona's golf tournament. I believe Camilo Benedetti shot 28 in the back nine to kind of back end his way into the top five or something like that. Well, that's um, yeah, it was pretty nice. And uh, I think he beat Steve by a shot or two because of that and steve was a senior on the team and and didn't he wanted to beat everybody every time he went out and and he literally before he put his clubs in our team van picked them up about a foot and a half over his head and body slammed them directly onto the concrete and i've still to this day i've never seen something quite as impressive as that feat so needless to say he got some new wedges and a few irons or ground him out you know after that but uh all, all it was, be, all it was quite team, hilarious all because a teammate beat him Exactly. Yes. Well, you know, he still wants to win the individual competition. Nice. Good <laughs> grief. I'm going to have to ask, uh, I'm going to have to have Steve Scott on the podcast, see if I can get some good, uh, good stories, but you mentioned, so you mentioned, we'll, we'll have to get him. I'll, I'll have to help you with that because he might tell some bad stories about me. Too, hey, that's, so. it works out good. So hopefully he'll listen to this and be like, all right, I got, I got to get on there and kind of le- level this thing out a little bit. So, <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned something really interesting. So you felt that you're, your success was limited as a professional because you weren't as, as tough. I mean, sure. do you have to be just an absolutely, you know, psychotic competitive person to succeed as a professional? <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, I, to be at the, the highest level, I, I believe you have to have um, a form of that. Yes. Does it have to be exactly that? No, I just tended to be, um, complacent with my, I'd be happy with my top fives. I didn't, uh, I didn't have the killer instinct to win quite enough. And, uh, Steve certainly had that. And, you know, my first collegiate championship was the NCAA championship in my senior year when I was graduated. So, um, well, and that shows that, something. Yeah. So that leads us in. So you spend your entire four years or you spend you know, your entire college career at, at UF and you're, you're, you get to the national championship and, you know, I'm not going to ask you to go through each and every shot, but were you? Thank goodness. Yeah, we're not going to do that. So we only have seven <laughs> hours to talk today. We can't go the full nine. But um, I mean, did you? I mean, there's really no no clever question I'm going to ask you that hasn't been asked before. But did it feel like a different tournament at the time? I mean, how did you compartmentalize everything to deliver at the highest stage in college golf? Sure. Yeah, it was only it was only my second NCAA championship too. At the time, we um, we didn't qualify for uh, the 2000 NCAA, and uh, I played only in '99. It was at Hazeltine. In '98, um, I was actually the sixth man and uh, didn't end up making the trip. So um, we had kind of gained some momentum um, leading towards 2001 NCAAs that was, you could kind of sense that as a team and I was starting to play a little better and, uh, had some really good advice from Chris Tooten, who was our assistant coach at the time about simple stuff. It was just, you know, focusing more on just engaging in my pre-shot routine, ensuring, you know, tempo and alignment were appropriate. Not anything, like you said, that you haven't heard before or questions or things that haven't been answered before, sure. but I'm, um, I'm of the belief that, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen until when well, we got, we had a rain delay and I, I, uh, Ben Banks would probably love to tell the story. I, I was, I was a big fan of talking to myself in the mirror, kind of like uh, Stuart Smalley does, you know, like yeah. you're uh, gosh, darn it. You can do it. You kind can of do stuff. it. You're good enough. You're good enough. Yeah, Nick. That was, that was me. And, uh, oh it was, uh, we had probably 27 or 20, I had 28 holes left uh, the last day. And, uh, it was then only then did I really realize that I had a chance to win. And uh, that, that positive Stuart Smalley self-talk worked out for me. So good enough. Hey, uh, they can, you know, no matter how you got it done, you got it done. They can't take that away from me. You're uh, your <laughs> NCAA individual champion of 2001. 
So, and team. Don't and, forget the team. That's true. That's true. And the team. And the team. So, so if you – let me ask you this. If you don't win a national championship as an individual and achieve that much, would you have still turned professional? What was the thought process? You know, you're, you're you know, halfway through the year of 2001. Was it an immediate decision to turn pro? Was that something you were leaning towards even before the national championship? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had intended to, but, you know, of course that reinforced all of my thoughts and it actually brought me, uh, you know, really only one or one start and uh, a couple and a little more endorsement money, which was obviously needed with our family. Well, not obviously for everyone listening, but we, you know, we didn't come up with a lot. So um, it was, uh, it was very helpful for me to get off on the right foot. Um, I may not have turned pro immediately after NCAAs. I may have played a little amateur golf um, during that summer. Um, you know, I have a chance potentially to, to make a run. That was a Walker cup year at ocean forest and just decided to turn pro instead. Um, and I would have probably done nothing different outside of have a little more confidence going into my professional career. Sure. Really. What were yeah. some of the exemptions or, or benefits and perks that you got from winning the national championship as an individual? Well, I listed them. I mean, I'd, I got the first exemption I played in was uh, the U S bank championship. Um, it was, uh, also Tiger Woods first PGA tour event, um, uh, as a professional exemption, right. you know, he, he said, hello world. I was more like, hello, Milwaukee. Nice <laughs> to see you. You know, where, where are the brats and free beer? You know, <laughs> nice. it's, what, what, what can I do to fatten myself up around here? But, um, and I did end up missing the cut. I, I shot even part of the first day and just ballooned day two. Um, but then I got some opportunities to, I, I, could have gone overseas quite a bit and um, at the time was about to get married to a girl I dated in college, which we are no longer, but um, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, th- there were, there were more opportunities given to me than I could have imagined um, because of it. So it was, it was a good time. So you, you play a handful of events and um, you, you make your way onto the ever popular at the time Hooters tour which yes, sir. is probably the, I guess that would be just the, the top mini tour, top national mini tour, I guess you could say at the time. Um, I mean, it wasn't yeah, just- it, it had, it had a couple, um, Grey Goose was around for a little bit yeah. and then uh, the Tar Heel tour and that became e-golf, I believe. But yeah, the Hooters tour really was, um, you know, that was the cat's meow of double a uh, golf really. Right. That was, that's where it was. You're going to have a chance to make some money and, you know, play, basically uh, glorified gambling um, week in, week out, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot different than, than it is now. It seems like you have a lot of these guys playing one day events for these, these on these mini tours, making, you know, you know, a couple thousand bucks playing, you know, at a golf course, you know, 30 minutes from their house. But this was actually a national yeah. tour where you traveled all over the country, just playing in. Well, as we spoke about earlier, uh, you said shit courses and shit towns. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but but you got but apparently you got a lot of wings. So yeah, um, uh, yeah. So so how uh, uh, yeah. with a discount, mind you, with a discount. Uh, it's so we funny. still it wasn't they weren't free. It was a discount. So so you you <laughs> I'm sure we could go and discuss all the different courses that you played in and all the different towns. But can you give me just a couple that most people would not have heard of that would just be like, where the hell did you play? Well, yeah, uh, let's see. I think it was uh, um, in Miami, Oklahoma, which is spelled like Miami. Um, <laughs> and I'm, and that was, a, that was a Native American reservation. Um, and, man, I'm trying to remember the name, but it was, you know, you're, you're just in the middle of nowhere for the most part. We were in uh, uh, just outside of uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, you know, you're spending time in... And, and some of some, you know, usually our favorites were places where there were a lot of casinos. So you could go and at least have something to do afterwards, because more often than not, you're lucky to find a, a Hardee's every four or five stoplights if there are that many in the town. So um, we we definitely uh, didn't always play the best golf course in the nicest of towns. So to your point, yes, shit, shit courses in shit towns. And, and, but and at the end of the day, someone was playing for 20 to 25 or $30,000 and some of the purses were even up to 50. So 
Gosh. And and did they, did the Hooters tour, was it marketed to these towns where you'd have galleries and people coming out and watching you play, or is that too much to ask for? Only in the retirement villages. Oh, my God, really? <laughs> well, they're not. Yeah. I mean, we had the, some of the best turnouts ever up in McCormick, South Carolina, which is north of Augusta. Um, you know, the whole neighborhood, um, the community just embraced the event, and I think they still do to this day, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it's Savannah Lakes is the name of the course. Actually, a very pretty place. Um, but uh, no, more we we did not have uh, overly exuberant crowds. No. Wow. And then you did play a little bit. You, you did tell me a story earlier that you did get to play a little bit uh, in South America. So tell me about your adventures in Guatemala. Yes. So, uh, you where, know, where Nick Gillum is a household name, apparently. Yeah. Well, uh, or in hospitals. Um, but, uh, regardless, uh, we played the golf course where you could see an active volcano, which is really neat. And I think there are a couple out in the Latin American tour right now, uh, still have the same uh, thing going on. I've seen a few pictures of guys out there playing, but, uh, we, we, it was a very challenging golf course. Um, but, Luck, lucky enough, we were in – there are different zones there based upon safety at the time. I don't know what it's like now in Guatemala City. Um, certainly, every security guard did have a semi-automatic weapon on them. And, you know, you're a little – it's a little disconcerting as a kid from Green Bay, Wisconsin. But uh, yeah, well, regardless – <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you better, you know, you better take full relief from that car path or else someone's going to mow you down with a semi-automatic weapon, apparently. Right. Yeah, exactly. We had to be very cautious, but uh, we did get bussed from our hotel to the golf course. Um, so after we'd always have with the Hooters tour events, a Wednesday pro-am and uh, the Wednesday pro-am in this case, I was lucky enough to meet some very nice, nice people seemed pretty high powered um, in the, Guatemala area. So we ended up going from the Hooters Pro-Am to the actual Hooters uh, for our post dinner, which was downtown. And there was a young gentleman um, that had been a bit overserved uh, that didn't, I don't know if he played in the Pro-Am or not, but um, he was being removed from the restaurant Whoops. right in front of me. He was being removed for um, groping a waitress's behind, which regardless of country, I always say is a bad idea. And uh, he, 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 as he was being removed, he, he picked up this kind of a, a three-legged lightweight placard holder and whipped it back at the restaurant just out of disgust. And, rah! and I was the one behind him, and I happened, it happened to hit me in my eye, right my left eye, right kind of just outside the orbital bone. And my initial reaction was like, what the, you know, right. um, kind of upset. And then I kind of heard a lady go, oh, no, and my, it was blood spurting out of my eye. And uh, got a pretty good cut, and they they did the best they could to kind of bandage it up at the uh, site, but realized quickly I was going to need stitches. So, lo and behold, I ended up going to one emergency room where the uh, tournament director, kind of executive committee member, Steve White, who's a great guy, funny guy, was lucky to be with him during the experience. He said, no, we're not. We're actually, you're not getting stitches here. So, <laughs> we went to site number two, and uh, he, he deemed it approvable. So we ended up um, getting stitches and, you know, I went back and visited one of my physician friends. He said they did a fantastic job. So no scarring to, to date and uh, still doing well. In fact, I finished seventh that week with a huge bandage over my eye. So, wow. you know, you get, I, I got a lot of support and love from the Hooters girls on site as well. Well, of course. I mean, you know, yeah. your poor baby got into a fight at, or not in a fight, but you just got injured in their restaurant. They got to take care yeah. of you a little bit. So. Yeah, it was love. It oh was nice. Gosh. Hooters tour. Oh. <laughs> Someone has to write a book about the Hooters tour. Well, that was kind of what I was planning to do once I uh, I left and I decided at 30 to not play golf anymore. I was like, man, I'm just going to put all my notes down. But never came to fruition. Maybe someday. Well, if you need a ghostwriter for it or need to get it recorded, I might be able to help out with that. So. <laughs> there you go. Good. Let's keep talking. Oh, I love yeah. it. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you didn't uh, you didn't stay in the Hooter store you did play several uh, PGA tour events and um, you also got into the the 2005 US Open now 05 was a crazy year for you regarding Q school and then playing a handful of events and then you get through local and sectional qualifying uh, in the US Open so yep. this is just a few years after after winning um, the national championship what was one of the times on the PGA tour when you're playing in an event where uh, you know it, it 
did you feel tremendously overmatched? Did you feel like it was just really out of your comfort zone? Because this is, you know, obviously it's just kind of right around Tiger Mania. So, uh, sure. you know, what are what were some of the tour events that you played in that uh, that really kind of caught your attention? Well, it was for me, obviously, the first one I played in in 2001. I, uh, that second day, I mean, the nerves that hit me knowing I, I could make the cut and the way I didn't respond as well as I wanted. You know, those are great lessons, though. And after that, I, I really felt more and more engaged and comfortable. Um, my game got better. I was more consistent with, you know, my shot shape, and I understood exactly how to plan out a golf course and um, continued to travel better. I mean, that's those are part of the things that you, you take for granted when you're in college. Um, people put all your planning and trips, you know, trip schedule together and outfits, and, you know, you just get better at all that stuff. It just becomes more of a, a seamless process. and. I know there are folks out there now that get exemptions straight out of college or even high school that have people helping them do it. But at the time for me, that was how I was growing in the game. And, uh, you know, the U S open itself, I felt comfortable. I was playing as good a golf as I have in my life at that point. I was always, I've always been a pretty, a very good driver of the ball and iron player and you know, U S opens tend to lend themselves well to people that are hitting fairways and greens. And so I felt, I felt very comfortable. Um, that week uh, at Pinehurst, um, but you know, sadly, I missed by two. I missed by two strokes make with on the cut. But my dad was carrying the bag, which couldn't be a neater Father's Day experience um, for that weekend, which was was a lot of fun. And I even got my name on the leaderboard early. I was one under through about five holes uh, late in the day. So I was at the top of the leaderboard for a minute. But then once I saw that, my heart rate went up to about 180 <laughs> beats per minute, and I made bogey, 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 um, but still great experience. Those types of moments will certainly be etched in my memory. Um, you know, I, I think outside of seeing my son make a hole in one or win a golf tournament until then, those are my favorite memories. Sure. And when you were playing PGA tour events, um, was it easy for you? And, and this is kind of unrelated to, to maybe the specific events you're playing in, but when you were out there, did you, kind of get a feeling there were some people out there really fighting for a job some people out there that were just looking to make a paycheck and then other people that were really looking to win every single week and you can kind of see that or absolutely okay. yeah it was easily discernible no doubt um you know the, those that were scraping it around and making making ends meet um were pretty easy to to notice the difference between the way their comfort level was that was seen between those that have been there for a while and understood you know, literally horses for courses. And I was lucky enough in the U S bank that I did make the cut to have Joey Sindelar with me on the first weekend of the cut or the first Saturday of that, that cut I made. Right. We we're walking in a twosome and, and, and the guy sauntered out. I was already grinding about an hour and a half before the, the actual Saturday. I think we're probably at nine 30 or something. And, um, he saunters out about 20 minutes prior to his tea time. And he's holding the, coffee and a donut, you know, and just gives nothing, nothing to do, but just, I'm going to hit a couple wedges. He had a Tommy armor, Tommy armor one on at the time, which was just a rocket ship, man. He just wailed that thing out there further than my own driver. He's like 45 years older than me, you know, I'm like, what the hell? Right. But, um, he, uh, he couldn't have been nicer and, uh, he knew what he wanted to do. He, he would, he would fly home on Sunday nights if, when he made the cut. Cause he pretty much made most cuts. And then you'd come back on Wednesday mornings and play in the pro-am and then play in the golf tournament. He'd done it long enough that he was just making his checks. And uh, the guys that, you know, you could tell that were certainly different or kind of had an air about themselves and were fairly untouchable. And uh, that's a hard skill skill set to develop. Yeah, because I, I, I kind of just I'm fascinated by the dynamic of of the PGA Tour where I guess where they market the the big high. Uh, the high profile people, you know, the Rickies and the Rory's and, and the, you know, obviously Tiger and Phil and, and all those guys. And, um, but there's guys out there that this is just their job. They're not, yeah. they're, they're going to be fine if they, you know, they're fine if they don't win, they're fine. They just need to make some cuts, make some paychecks. And I mean, so you saw that out there. You're well, they're still, they still fit the mold of their, you know, what is a great, 
great slogan for the tour, but that, that these guys are good or was a great slogan because they, I mean, they, they were very good and their game would travel. And, sure. but yeah, to them, you know, maybe the fame and, and, and all of that just wasn't what thing. you aspire, you know, to have, you'd rather have the family life. And sometimes it, you know, it's hard to imagine a Jack Nicholas that had kids so early and, you know, how you know, he, he, he did, he, he was obviously a grinder as well, but you know, it's everybody comes from, different means and has a story of their own and and uh yeah you could definitely you could see the dichotomy dichotomy pretty quickly when it comes to good better best which um certainly is true in all forms of life sure and then you know the the u.s open that you made uh getting through now did you have to do local qualifying also or did you just go right to sectional i did get i went through uh the grasslands in lakeland okay and uh on to old memorial uh, in tampa is it? Uh, it was hot. <laughs> I, I mean, is the pressure of, now I know you've gone through Q school. That's the pressure of, jo- of the, of the job. Uh, compare that to the pressure of a, of a sectional qualifier for the U S open. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's great amount of pressure. I, I was lucky. I was playing so well at the time that I really didn't feel too much, but, um, I've since felt it as an amateur <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to play against these guys, but no, at the time it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It was my job and it, it felt right. But uh, yeah, there, I mean, you want to be there as badly as possible. I mean, it was that there's, there's nothing more to drive you to play in our national championship. Um, if we, I wish there was a Monday qualifier for Augusta and then I, I would have oh been there God. too. But. <laughs> oh, that would be, that would actually be nuts if there's a Monday qualifier for Augusta. Well, they're going to have a women's event out there. They I might know. as well have, you know, a Monday qualifier. It makes sense. Open it up. Oh but regardless, that's a whole that's a whole different story. But yeah, I was lucky there also in, um, at Old Memorial to have my dad on the bag. And he pulled a few antics while we were out there, just keeping me loose. He oh, made, well, we got to hear about this. So he, uh, oh man, let's see. For those that are listening or will listen, um, Old Memorial has, let's see, number five, I believe, is a very challenging dog leg left par four. Um, I played, I sat 67, I believe, and was leading by a few maybe at the turn, uh, well, after 18. And I had already made, I think I birdied three and four, so I was was going nicely. And uh, on five, I just had a brain fart and pulled it right into the water. And I, I knew the second I hit it, it was going in the water, but my dad continually as a good caddy and was fired up knowing he's got a chance to get me in the U S open was going to watch that ball down. And as I walked back to the bag to grab a ball, and put my club in the bag because I know I was going to have to walk up and take a drop. He says, splash. <laughs> I don't really think I needed to hear the descriptor of what, what just happened. You know, that's, that's not a good caddy move. So like he's a commentator move actually. Yeah, I mean. exactly. So, and he was right in our group and everyone knows, you know, there's obviously the guy I'm playing well, but he, uh, he's been named splash ever since. And it, it actually added levity to my, my stress, you know, and, yeah. uh, it, it kind of made me laugh all the way down the fairway and I, I made a good bogey and we moved on. So nice. Well, uh, the, so the open that you played in again, that was at Pinehurst. Uh, that was the one that, uh, the, the famous Michael Campbell, My, yeah, Michael Campbell. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, that's what people say about that 2001 national champion. So it's okay. Oh no, come on now. Everyone knows <laughs> that, I mean, there's, there's gotta be streets named after you in Gainesville, right? There uh, are absolutely. It's, it's just a matter of time, just a matter of time. So you, what was the kind of the turning point where you just were like, yeah, I think it's time to go get a job and, and maybe, you know, uh, you know, start playing some amateur golf. You know, was there anything specifically that kind of moved you in that direction? I didn't want to play amateur golf when I stopped playing yet. I I didn't want to play golf. Um, yeah, I got got burnt out on not getting through Q school my last year. I'd stopped working as hard at it. Um, you know, going back to buddy Alexander, we used to have check-ins, and uh, at the end of the year specifically, we would talk about what you've gotten better at. We talk about stroke average. We talk about just, you know, efficiencies is gained. And um, I just kind of lost, lost the juice out in the tour on the mini tours. And if you can't beat the guys in the mini tours, you're not going to beat the guys in the big tour. Right. So um, and I've, I've seen a lot of older gentlemen maintaining their time out in the mini tours and, you know, just etching out a, a life. But it wasn't for me. I knew there was more in front of me. And I, so I didn't get through Q school first stage 
uh, in 2009. And um, from there, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something else. wasn't a great job market at the time, but I was just ready to fly. I was 30 years old and uh, I just, I wanted to find a way to, to do something else, figure out what, what's out there for me. Um, you know, golf, golf will always be there, I'm sure, but I just wasn't ready to commit to it again for a while. So like, like a bad putter, sometimes you just got to put it on the shelf or put it, you know, back in the rack somewhere to remind it that until it behaves better, you're not going to be friends with it. Yeah. That was yeah. What, that's how I felt about golf at the time. <laughs> well, then it's funny though, that you mentioned that you didn't want to play, but then the job you get, you're still involved with golf and you just kind of, I mean, when I, when I saw the, the actual job title that you had at foot joy, I was just thinking to myself, God, that just, that sounds cool. You are the manager of amateur player promotions. That just yes. sounds made up. So I mean, yeah. that doesn't sound real. So try and convince me that that was a real job. What did you do for foot joy? <laughs> First of all, getting back to your initial thought, there's no doubt that it came to me and it took about a year and about a year before I even thought, and I wasn't going to play golf quite yet then anyway, but I was still interested in the industry. It would have been great to find a job in the golf industry right away, right. but it, there just weren't any open. Um, so a- anyway, what did I really do? I gave away a lot of product, a lot of free product to people that were deserving of it and hopefully going to spread the good word about how great the product was like podcast so, hosts, right? Exactly. Well, maybe well, didn't you wear a lot of pink though? I don't know. I used, I used to make people wear outlandish colors. I probably should have sold or given you a lot of those pink shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually there is a story about that, that I'll share as soon as you're done telling me what this, you know, hypothetical <laughs> position you had. Go ahead. Manager of, so manager of so, amateur player promotions. What I would do is I'd go to um, elite events a talk to players about their interest if they wanted to have um, what what I would consider basically a package within the influential amateur scene. This is primarily mid ams too that I'm talking about, and we would give them those packages and ensure that they would stay consistently wearing them. So that within counts at the mid am or the US am, hopefully if they were to play in those or different events that had counts, they would help us add to those specific counts. Um, and then I would help. Collegiate teams um, dress into our apparel and our shoes, uh, help them with fittings. Imagine, um, I know it's hard to believe, but college kids tend to wear the wrong size shoes quite a bit. Um, oh, and then, I can believe that. <laughs> and then uh, I would I would help with some of those bigger events during the course of the summer, like the Northeast Am or the Transmiss or the Porter Cup and um, Dogwood, um, ensure that they had whatever promotional product they would like to have from their tea gift. Now it did become a bit overboard and it still is somewhat the gifting process because I think in 2002, the USGA opened up the uh, allowable limit of gifts that an amateur could receive. So it was a different thing for me. I didn't have that growing up in the amateur game and uh, there was a learning curve for me there, but um, it was fun. I got to see some of the greatest golf courses in the United States meet some of the most wonderful people and uh, you know, getting to travel was, was certainly fun um, and I didn't have to pay for it. So even better. Yeah. So um, help me understand the whole process of what an amateur. Now I know, you know, if you, you can't give stuff or that's very limited, you give it to the college, not the player. So I understand that for, yeah, for the college part. Yep. Yeah. So I understand that, but explain to me how a mid am can get one of these, how, how they can get one of these, packages from a club rep and not be in violation of of their amateur status so how does the usg from my understanding um i'm no longer in the industry and i don't believe it's changed but uh, usga um, allowed that there would be um, equipment exchange between manufacturers and and amateurs Uh, it's just the, the ncaa is the only institution that actually had uh, policies in place that would say that it had to go to the college coach first and then hand it off to the player. So if you have an amateur that like you have a mid am that has just, you know, that just travels all around the country and um, plays in a lot of high profile events, you can dress them foot, to, you know, uh, head to toe and foot joy and Titleist and Titleist clubs and, and Vokey wedges and Cameron putters and bags and just get completely take care of their entire equipment. And it's, it's 
doesn't endanger their amateur status. Correct. And and I think the best analogy to put back towards your comment is, you know, the Olympics, they've been doing it forever. Okay. Yeah. You and, know, and I'm just asking just cause I, I you know, just kind of curious how that whole thing works. Yeah, it is. Uh, it was interesting for me. Um, and it was fun. Um, I, I didn't have enough for everyone, but certainly those that did play the most and had, had, uh, you know, championships on mind would, would get more of the attention. Um, just like I talked about buddy with his players, you know, the ones that were playing the best were certainly going to get the most attention. Sure. And, um, and that's the, um, the, the neatest thing for me was, um, seeing the smiles on their faces, the gratitude, um, the thank yous. Uh, and then, you know, I, I started to do, I, I, after a while, I just would name the packages, like after nicknames, I would give them. So when they'd arrive at their doorstep, it would at least put a smile on their face, you know, sure. when they'd arrive. So, <laughs> yeah, I remember when I played, uh, my, my only USGA tur- event was a 2012 US Mid-Am and I saw you there and I forget what we were talking about, but you're saying something, how no one's birdie day. It was at Conway farms where they played the BMW oh, yeah. and something about, uh, I forget what we were talking about, but you, but you said something about how no one's been able to birdie 18 or no one's done anything in 18. And you were like, you birdie 18, Ben, I'll get you a free pair of shoes. <laughs> and, uh, didn't, didn't really need to give you my shoe size. Didn't, didn't, didn't need to bother telling you that. Cause I did not, uh, yeah, no chance. But uh, I probably, I, I probably, uh, I was like, man, I can't believe he did it, and I didn't, I didn't want to chip him to you or something. No, 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 no. I would totally tell you if I did. So no, <laughs> not even close. Not even close. Um, well, hopefully, you still have my card. Yeah. I'll, well, I'll, I'll pull it up somewhere. So or do some <laughs> clever editing on this podcast and <laughs> see what happens. But, uh, but so, so you got out of the, the golf, uh, the golf business, but you still, you still do play. And, and now, well, well, you, you were working for foot joy. You, you, you know, when did you get the bug again to start playing? Was it just mainly being around all these great players that kind of gave you the, the, the impetus to get back into it? Obviously. Yes. Um, it, and, and reinstating after getting the job was, was a no brainer for me. So it, it did take, uh, Mine was a little over two, two and a half years, I believe, um, in my waiting period. Um, it was definitely uh, exciting to be able to play again. And I was lucky I had the, the connections to get into certain events. And sure. I, I competed I competed well early. Uh, and after a while, it just it got harder because at events, I'd be working while playing, uh, be giving doing giveaways and shipping and, and dealing with all these things instead of just really focusing on being in the range. But right. um, it was fun. The duality of being in that sense was, was quite, um, original. I was the first person to have the role with foot joy. Um, there's a new person that's replaced me. His name's, I probably shouldn't say it on this podcast. Actually, he's a great guy though. And, uh, there's no doubt. Um, I loved being able to, to play again. I, I found a newfound respect for it, but I wasn't going to shit courses and shit towns. I was going to the, the best courses possible in oh, mint yeah. condition, playing against the best condition or best players in the amateur golf. So, um, you know, and, and then of course, getting to know the cocktail circuit a little bit with the mid ams out there and, and, and understanding some of those opportunities, um, really that, that piqued my interest even further. Yeah. That's a different world. I mean, we have people listening to the podcast that are, you know, whether they're scratch players or 20 handicappers and everything in between, but, but that cocktail circuit, I mean, that is just the elite. Um, I mean, the elite courses, the elite players, I mean, did, I mean, you're, you know, playing professionally obviously helped it, but then also what you did in college helped. But, um, the, the people in there, I mean, I, I was recently, uh, I, I spoke to Gene Elliott recently and he's, he's in, in that world and TJ Schwartz in that world. And sure. a lot of other people that I've, I've spoken to, uh, I mean, did you ever think in a million years to be playing on those courses and in those events at, at 30, you know, 30, 35 years old? No, I never did. Um, and, uh, it's a fun experience and, you know, more often than not, you run across people that are the best and, uh, you know, it's for those that are trying to network in, in certain industries, it's a great opportunity for them to do so. Um, it isn't just all play. Yeah. There's certainly some work involved. Um, but at, at the same time, um, I didn't play in all of them too. So I played in just a few and then I would promote with, with event, with product there. So, 
um, I'm hoping to try and reimmerse myself over time, but having a, a kid and a full-time job and limited uh, funding certainly <laughs> isn't possible to do them all, but yeah, I, a boy, a boy can dream. Sure. Well, you can't play in everything. So that's, that's why we're, we're working stiffs doing our thing. Um, that's right. You, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned your buddy Camilo Vijegas from, from college oh, yeah. days. And, sure. uh, he is well. He's known for his cycling. He's known for his, uh, you know, Jay Lindeberg uh, fashion choices, and then also his unique method of reading, uh, reading putts. And <laughs> did you see that in college? Uh, his Spider Man uh, kind of, uh, I mean, brilliant marketing. But but did you ever see that in college? Well, you know, funny enough, he didn't read putts like that before there are crowds. But uh, oh, oh, you mean if there's no cameras around, he just he just crouches down like everyone else? Yeah, it's it's shocking, yeah, I know. You know. But it, it was it was one of those funny moments. I was still around Gainesville, and he was as well. And uh, there might have been some experimenting, I guess, prior to uh, said experience. But I think the first one that really was the highlight for folks was the Players Championship. I don't remember the year now. Shoot, I'm getting too old, but. It was the uh, third round, I know that, and it was a back hole location at 17. Um, we were having a, uh, a, I think he finished third that year as well. I'm pretty sure about that. He uh, was describing to me um, during our celebratory session at the Swamp Restaurant in Gainesville that, um, bro, I knew. I just, it's a perfect spot. <laughs> and it was, I mean, people were in awe. He had his leg hanging over the Island green. I mean, it was, you just can't beat stuff like that. So he, he was, what, what I can say about Camilo is he is one of the sharpest individuals I've been around. He, he plans things to a T. Um, he got bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger during his collegiate career. And uh, I'm proud of him. He's won a lot on tour too. People, or you know, surprised to hear his numbers, but he's been grinding it out for a while. But yeah. <laughs> there's no doubt he did not do the Spider Man um, at SEC championships or anything like that. You know, so well, yeah, no, that was that was brilliant. And gosh, I mean, that's I think he got a deal. Yeah, I just remember seeing commercials of him doing that. I mean, that was just a that was brilliant. That was absolutely brilliant. Yep, yep. So, great marketing maneuver. Oh, absolutely. Um, let's see, I'll fit this one back in too. So you you've I had the you had Buddy Alexander as your as your golf coach and tons of stories with him and had great experiences, but there there also is a relationship that you have with uh, with the other ball coach over at uh, UF. Uh, tell me uh, tell me about one of the r most recent times you played golf with Steve Spurrier. Well, um, I've been blessed to play with a lot of great people in my life, but um, even uh, as a Packer fan, there are a lot of folks I'd still like to check off the list, but. Being able to play golf, um, we played at Gator Golf Day. J.C. Deacon, the new men's golf coach at Florida, yeah. was nice enough to set me up with, with Coach Spurrier now that he's back as an ambassador for us before he goes back to this new arena league he's figuring out. But uh, um, the uh, the neat thing is, is he you know he remembered me from college days, and he didn't know me until I won NCAA, NCAAs, I promise you, but he knew me after that. And uh, he was – he's just – it's a – it's a great time to be able to play with a legend like that. He's, he's not getting around as well as he used to. He's asking for swing tips as we were driving around, but, uh, um, he was great. He didn't, he, and I had a beer with me while we were out there and he wouldn't, he wouldn't even have any. So I tried, wow. but, uh, there's, <laughs> he said he had to speak somewhere later that evening engagement. He's getting, you know, all right. So let me uh, ask a couple, a uh, couple remaining questions. We ask these at the end of every episode. Uh, it's a quick bucket at the back of the range golf podcast. So, um, 86 Jack won the masters compare that to a potential fifth green jacket of tiger woods, which would be the more substantial victory. Hmm. That's a tough question. Um, and I, that's why you asked it. You asked it for a reason. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say at this point, knowing what I see with tiger's health and, um, and, and, and the, the competition he's got, I'm, I'm going to say tigers would be more impressive. Yeah. All right. That works. Uh, you can give a major championship to anyone in history, whether they are alive or dead. Uh, no majors, 18 majors, male or female, doesn't matter. Who would you give a major championship to? Well, my father. That's going to be, that's a pretty popular answer lately. Yeah. Yeah. Got to give Splash one. Which, which major is <laughs> Splash? Splash would love to win the Masters. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a yeah. Great, that's a great nickname. <laughs> um, that's awesome. That's perfect. Huh. 
we'll see. Um, well, Nick, I, I appreciate the time. I will definitely, uh, we definitely need to keep tabs on your, your playing exploits. I know you, that you just got done playing the Tim Aquana Cup with a runner-up finish there uh, up in Jacksonville. So yep. we uh, we will wish you the best, and we'll keep track, and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. And uh, as everyone listening imagines, uh, you probably have just stacks and stacks of, uh, of Pro V1s lying around, so you know, don't be afraid to send some my way. Absolutely, Ben. They're, they're right on the way, obviously, for my uh, <laughs> my payment to just, you know, memorialize me. So thank you for that. Oh, God. All right. Thanks for joining at the back of the range. I'll talk to you soon. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. And there you have it. Another great episode here at the Back of the Range Golf Podcast. That was episode number 30. Gosh, thank you so much to Nick Gillum for taking the time to uh, share some stories from his days at UF and his days playing professionally. We're going to be back next week with another episode here at the back of the range, but um, let's give away another towel. So for those of you that are listening to the episode, you early birds that downloaded it right away on Wednesday morning, here's what you do. My email address is ben at the back of the range dot com. Shoot me an email. Tell me who is in the three way playoff with Jean Vandeveld and Paul Laurie at the 99 Open Championship at Carnoustie. I know that no one forgot Vandeveld and no one forgot Lori, but who is that third person? First person that sends me an email, I'm sending you a towel. Thanks so much. Enjoy your week. We'll see you next time here at the Back of the Range.